Hi, Dan Gustin here. Welcome to The Wood Age, Season 1, Episode 4. A highly opinionated history of the Splitting Mall. I'm still working my way through Roland's book. And he has obsessed over the geometry of the prehistoric stone axe, and he's finding it close to the geometry of the splitting mall. And he is now waxing poetically from there. There is, of course, no historical connection, and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't claim one. But uh, he sure is excited by what he's discovered, and he has uh, made another big mistake in his adventure. And I have never read from this book before. I mean, it's copyrighted and I didn't want to do a lot of quoting, but I am going to read this. One should never try to split wood using an ordinary steel axe. With its narrow blade, it all too easily gets stuck in the log. May I drop this book on the floor and stamp upon it? Uh, it would be childish, I know, and I'm trying to be nice, but I grew up watching my father split wood with a common, ordinary axe. And I spent a fair amount of my life doing the same thing. And here's how it works. If you hold the axe about here where it balances, so you don't have any pressure on your wrist, and the axe doesn't, uh, the axe doesn't uh, uh, weigh anything, so it's just part of your hand, and you never put it down. Uh, you got a stump, and you reach down and pick up the piece of wood, which is not easy to do with one hand, but you got the axe, see, so you got two hands, and you pick it up and put the wood down, and don't bother to balance the wood. You, Dad always put his thumb on top of the wood, just like that, kind of marking the place. And then he'd throw the axe up and uh, extend it, you see, as he threw it up. And that takes no effort. And he'd come down and uh, lift his hand back just as the axe hit the wood. So there was no worry about the wood falling over or worrying about, uh, and it was a very uh, efficient and no work. Because the axe weighs three or four pounds, and it's not, not a problem in one hand. You never put it down. Uh, I suppose, to be honest, we, uh, we, I have to admit that we never bothered to try to split any wood that was hard to split. Uh, the idea of splitting wood that's difficult to split is a modern idea. And my thesis today is that the splitting hammer, the maul, is a modern tool. And there is, I have a contest today. I am betting you dollars to donuts that no one, none of you can find me an intentionally made splitting mall that goes back farther than the railroad. Because my, my sense is that the splitting mall came from the railroad. Now here's a railroad hammer. I borrowed this from a friend at the flea market, and you can see how the end uh, looks a whole lot like a splitting mall, but it, uh, it hasn't been used much. And I have no idea what they uh, used it for in, uh, in, in the railroad, but there are a couple of uh, places here where it seems to have been driven very tightly uh, between something metal because it's been pushed. And that would uh, <clears throat> require working metal with it. I, I'm not an expert on the railroad. And this, this part is beautifully mushroomed, uh, showing, showing us how, what, good, what good metal this is, for starters. And this, I'm guessing, is a striker's hammer. Now, a uh, required reading in this course here is the autobiography of Carl Sandburg. Uh, it's titled, Always the Young Strangers. And if you want to know what the title means, it took me a couple of readings to figure it out, because he doesn't tell you, is just go back to your high school 
and find, see how fast it is you find out that you don't own the corridors anymore. Somebody else owns the corridors. They're full of young strangers. Sandberg's father was a striker for the railroad. He made bolts all day. Uh, as the years passed, there came by slow growth, layers of muscle making a hump on his right shoulder. He was day on day swinging sledges and hammers on hot iron on an anvil. Striker for the railroad. And you can tell by the way his, uh, his shoulder built up that he was swinging a heavy hammer with two hands. And that is my guess, is the swinging of a heavy hammer with two hands. It didn't start with the railroad. The uh, uh, blacksmiths use strikers, and if you've, uh, and you probably have, looked at the sword makers and so forth on YouTube, and you know they use strikers as well. Uh, here is an earlier striker's hammer, probably. I, as I say, I'm not an expert, but this has got to be a blacksmith's tool uh, for, heavy, for heavy blacksmith work. And if you can focus closely on this area here, you can see how this handle was broken clean off in one stroke uh, by, over, by overshooting, by, by missing, by using it as a, uh, as a splitting maul and missing the piece of wood and going over like that. You can see how it's squashed here and busted off back here. It's very heavy and has a very small handle. It was not made for uh, splitting wood, but somebody used it for splitting wood, and somebody broke it splitting wood. So here, I su suspect, is the source of the uh, splitting maul, and I don't have a splitting maul, and we never had one on the farm, and uh, I wouldn't dream of using one. You have a splitting maul, you have to uh, pick up the piece of wood. You gotta put the maul down. It's heavy. You can't handle it in one hand. You gotta pick up the piece of wood. You gotta put it on the stump. You can't really split heavy wood with a maul on the ground because the ground mostly is too soft and it's too cushiony. Uh, to split wood, you need a, a base under the wood whose mass uh, somehow relates to the piece you're splitting. So if you're splitting, splitting a big piece of wood, you need a big stump to do it. So you lift this big piece of wood up, and that's a lot of work, and you put it on the stump, and then you have to balance it, because you can't hold it. You have to, you have to balance it by itself, so it's got to be sawn, which is probably uh, not, it's, again, it's a modern thing. Uh, old In the old days, cordwood was mostly chopped, and then you pick up the maul and you swing it high over your head and it weighs about 10 pounds and you bring it down as hard as you can and, and you, you split this piece of wood and then, and then you put it down again and you got to turn the piece and it's just so much work. And the thing about the way my father and I did it here on the farm and basically everybody else uh, is there's no labor and it's quick. But it requires uh, not bothering to split uh, difficult wood. You, you, do, you left the difficult wood in the woods. And this is, uh, this is a uh, principle that has to be recognized. This is I and Roland, and we all live in our own environments. And we have to remember that uh, our environment is not the only environment. I live in a wood, in a environment rich in wood. If you want to take a look at just those beams out on the lawn, uh, you, you can count you can count the knots on one on the fingers of one hand. That's that's those pine logs are far higher quality than than run of the mill pine logs you'll find any place else.
anyway, I I know a fellow up in Warner who is a lifetime professional firewood provider. He would uh, cut his logs, uh, yard them up, uh, chainsaw, uh, cut them, cut them to length, and then he'd just walk around, walk around in, uh, in uh, amongst his wood with a light axe, and uh, and he'd just go clop, 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 and and. Uh, Smack them, uh, smack them horizontally. They're laying on the ground. Smack them horizontally with a quick kind of a, kind of a clip with a light axe, and split about half the stuff uh, before he even uh, even got around to loading it. The uh, if if you've got a light axe and it's sharp, and uh, your wood is not giant, uh, you can actually uh, use the mass of the wood itself against the mass of the axe and do some very, very effective and very fast splitting again without breathing hard. So that's my, that's my argument. And uh, uh, how are we doing for time? Good, good time. Okay. I uh, started with this because uh, I borrowed this hammer from a fellow at the flea market, and I gotta bring it back to him, so I wanna make sure to get that in. Uh, I have a few questions. A few questions have been asked. Uh, one is, why do you have to turn the volume up to listen to these uh, videos that we're making? And the answer is that that's our technology, and we're old people, and that's pretty much how it's gonna be. Uh, one of you suggested I needed a microphone. It's not going to help because the problem between me and the uh, and the smartphone here is not where the problem is. The problem is where the smartphone uh, attaches to the computer. That's where we lose our volume, and we don't know what to do about that. And, and we got other things to do than worry about it. So with apologies, you're going to have to just turn the volume up. Remember to turn it down at the end, or you'll get blasted out the next time you try to watch Netflix. Anyhow. Uh, also, someone has called and asked, uh, uh, who's Lucy? Uh, at the end of, uh, of uh, episode three, I held up one of my uh, true spoons, which, by the way, uh, I, call, I now call Clovis Point Informants. If, uh, if you uh, know what I mean, or if you don't, go back and watch three again, and you'll, you'll see what I mean. And this is the, one of the latest ones. Look how, look, look at the, the shape of that. This is just pretty much how it, how it split off, and, uh, and I polished it down a bit. And if I, was, uh, if I was of a mind, I could drive this right through my leg, but I'm not going to. I'll take, you have to take my word for it. This is one heck of a, one heck of a tool. And uh, uh, this is the spoon, this is the split of wood that Lucy wore in her hair. Now Lucy uh, is what the archaeologist, the paleontologist, named that uh, skeleton, that, uh, that fossilized skeleton of the first, uh, the earliest uh, human or hominid who walked on, who walked upright. Uh, with hips and legs and so forth like that. About three and a half million years ago, a, a female uh, killed by falling out of a tree, almost certainly, the forensics have been done, and they named her, they found her in the old Dubai Gorge, uh, where I remember as a student back in the 60s, I was told that uh, you know, Dr. Leakey's beer bottles could still be found. Uh, probably, if you went there today, you wouldn't find any. They've all been collected, and they're sitting on people's knick-knack shelves. But uh, that's where these critters are being found. And uh, the paleontologists named her Lucy because their favorite tune, a popular tune at the time, was a Beatles song called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So that's who Lucy is. And I do apologize for my metaphorical use of these things, but I use her for the early, uh, our earliest ancestor. So Lucy represents your 25,000 great-grandmother three and a half million years ago, and this is, in my opinion, her tool. And one of the reasons why I want to get some of these uh, academics 
of watching this YouTube presentation is because I expect sooner or later they're going to find one. And when they do, it'll be the point of a spear. We talked about that uh, last time. Uh, they're going to find one, and I want them to know that they saw it here first. Once upon a time, I was uh, set up, uh, Missy and I were set up, uh, uh, in front of the Museum of uh, Natural History in New York City on uh, Columbus Avenue. And it was a craft fair uh, being run by a, a group of, uh, of artists who supported themselves by running this craft fair once a year. And uh, there were nice people to deal with who called themselves the street painters, but I'm getting off the subject. And, and here I was with my spoons laid out selling them to people on the street. And this fellow came by, came out of the museum, and he came by, and he looked at my work, and he just about fell down. He said, I've been looking for this stuff for, for years. I, I'm an archaeologist, and these are the spoons of the Iron Age. Well, the Iron Age, and it's about a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, the peat bogs, Tallinn man, and all that. Uh, and I expect he's right. In fact, that would be how I would be making my spoons split out and so forth. I didn't bring examples here, but you see them there. They're on my YouTube channel. You can find them. You probably already have. And uh, this is uh, there's evidence all over the place that uh, I'm, I'm getting this right. And now I'm uh, talking about the last episode. And let me. Uh, those are the only two questions I have. So uh, uh, the. Uh, the job for you is uh, I, I want each and every one of you to begin making these and don't forget uh, split them out of green wood they'll come out all done there's not much more to do with them but be sure to cook them dry in some kind of oil it doesn't matter what you use it could be cooking oil in your own kitchen or, or whatever you got uh, you can if they're small enough make a small one do it in a do it in a saucepan uh, on a stove and uh, you know, make, a, make a batch, and uh, let, let me know how you come out, and, and let me see the oldest splitting hammer you can find, because I guarantee you it will not be older than the railroad. Okay, so those are the questions, and I'm looking for more. You can uh, get hold of me on my... Uh, on my website, which, and I've forgotten what it is now, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're, do, we're doing well here. Uh, but you'll, you'll, it, I, I mentioned on every one of these episodes, so you'll find it on another one. And uh, I wanted to explain why I have uh, decided to call this season one. Uh, I've, I've decided to, to operate by uh, using this book to tell you what I know about uh, primitive woodworking. And uh, what I found as I go through the book, I'm telling you all the things I can tell you quickly. And I'm putting aside all the longer stories, which are very good stories. And season two is going to be the longer stories, which I'm kind of making a note of. And, and I think they will be even better. If you're enjoying season one, season two will be even better. Uh, season three is going to have to do with the relationship, uh, I imagine, between the academic and the practitioner. You guys are the practitioners. And we are the practitioners. And I have uh, begun to consider the process by which an academic who has all the information just doesn't get it right. And this happens a lot. I've been watching this. I've been in the craft art business for about 50 years, and I've been watching craft artists find the uh, academics uh, wanting time after time after time. And I... Uh, going to uh, provide a, uh, a literal breakdown, I think, of uh, how this happens. What are the mental processes by which uh, mistakes are made? And that will be episode three. So 
So that's the pattern. And I think we'll probably stop here because if I get started with something else, I'll run out of time.